Um, nuclear data for the thorium fuel cycle and transmutation by uh, Frank Gunsing from the CEA. I was just getting wired up. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. I would like to thank the organizers to make it possible that I make this presentation today. So I will talk about nuclear data for the thorium fuel cycle and transmutation. But in reality, of course, I will focus on a facility that is here at CERN to measure nuclear data. But first, let's go through a few uh, slides introducing this nuclear data topic. So, whenever you want to design a reactor or make calculations on criticality or safety or, or anything related to reactors, it needs a lot of input. And one of the crucial inputs is nuclear data input. And this goes through a layer of simulations, uh, Monte Carlo simulations or deterministic simulations. And all these simulations depend on nuclear data. And this is evaluated nuclear data libraries. There are several of these libraries. We heard of some of them yesterday. Jeff, Jendel, Andev, Braun, Sandel, several others. And this is one part, uh, evaluated nuclear data libraries. Of course, they do not exist like that. They have to be fed with experiments. So there are lots of measurements. There are theory models that, that make them fit to uh, so you can describe these data, and there is a stage of uh, evaluation, validation, and all these things are interacting, and in the end, they appear in this evaluated nuclear data library. The advantage of such a library is that it contains everything. There are no gaps, clean data, you have everything. If it is correct, what is in, that is another thing, of course. Uh, okay, and then seen from the uh, reactor physicist, uh, um, or industrial point of view, there are users, which are reactor designers, for example, and producers, people on the other side of this library, and the evaluated data library is in the middle of the thing. So, I will talk today about the other side, about the producer side. Um, of course, these evaluated nuclear data libraries are not only for reactors, it is meant as a general purpose uh, library, and there are several um, applications for that, most of them, of course, related to um, nuclear technology, but also to astrophysics uh, for nuclear stellar synthesis and, okay, dosimetry, all the other things. So this is an example of, of data in an evaluated nuclear data library. So this is uranium-238. You see all the cross-sections, total, fission, uh, capture. You see also the uh, threshold reactions and then prime and XN reactions popping up at higher energies. So this is what is typically in an evaluated nuclear data library. But of course, uh, this is the only thing you can handle if you want to make complicated calculations. But this is of course made up of several experiments that have to be evaluated, uh, covering only partly uh, the, the full energy range listed here on, on, on over 10 decades of energy. Um, when we put, okay, this is the same plot as just before, and then typical fluxes, Newton fluxes, fluxes that we can see in, um, in, in real life. For example, if we have a fully water-moderated flux in a nuclear reactor, you are here around a thermal point, uh, let's say 25 milli electron volt. If you take the uh, Newton spectrum coming out of fission by uranium-235 by thermal Newtons, you are here around 1 MeV. And in between, you have what we call the stellar spectrum, so spe uh, spectra in uh, stars, uh, also responsible for the synthesis of all the elements that we know. And these are typically in between. So the region here is, uh, the, the full region here is interest of interest for nuclear technology, and this part covers, as well, the interest for nuclear astrophysics. That is why these things are quite uh, related. And if we look now at all the nuclei that we know, this is the chart of nuclei as a function of neutron numbers, proton numbers, these are all the nuclei that are 
uh, known as nuclei, and the black ones here in the middle are the stable ones. So we have the actinides here, and we have here a region of nuclei which are interesting for astrophysics, but as well for nuclear technology, because they are fission products or structure materials, that kind of thing. This is the same card of nuclei, but for nu stellar nuclear synthesis, and here people are interested in the full cross-sections of all these nuclei that are there, uh, and following several paths of the synthesis of nuclei. Um, and when we zoom in into this region of the actinides, you see here the buildup of actinides, uh, starting here from thorium, going to curium, and of course, as you know, if you start at these higher regions, starting with uranium-5 and with a lot of uranium-8 inside, then it's much easier to go to the higher actinides, and this is creating this high radiotoxicity. If you start with thorium-232 and uranium-233, you are much further away, and this reduces, uh, by a factor of 100 or something, the, the, the radiotoxicity of spent fuel regardless of the, of the fission products, of course, because that is uh, similar. So how are nuclear data doing uh, in, in Europe in general? Maybe it's, it's, uh, it's a sign of how it's going worldwide, but uh, I will mention this for Europe. So there are usually small teams working in facilities doing this type of measurements, and most of them are funded by national programs, uh, not a lot, but just enough to survive. Um, of course, the, all these efforts are coordinated later to get evaluated data, li data libraries, and the OECD, the NEA, is, uh, is coordinating this program to, in, the, in the GEF evaluated data file. And also the EC is funding um, uh, quite a lot of programs. Here is uh, the, the, f the famous uh, framework programs going from framework 4 to, to the upcoming uh, second call for FP7. And these are a list of, 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 of programs that uh, were able to fund um, and, and, and also make a kind of infrastructure of, of, uh, of people and facilities that are interacting uh, um, on nuclear data. So, now it's time to go to CERN. We are here at CERN, the Entoff facility that is, was created uh, in, uh, by the end of the 90s by Carlo Rubia. He initiated this project because he saw with his uh, energy amplifier and following the TARC experiment that lots of nuclear data were missing for uh, new concepts because even if the evaluated data libraries are fine for existing reactors to get them running. As soon as you want to do something else, like high burn-up or new types of fuel, uh, new fuel cycles even, then you need much more uh, nuclear data, at least more accurate nuclear data. And um, the idea was to, to use a, a piece of lead and use the CERN a uh, proton beam of 20 jav over C, which is an enormous amount of energy, to create a lot of neutrons and then measure cross-sections with time of flight. And, okay, let's see where we are now. So this is uh, uh, CERN here, display on the picture of Europe. And when we go to CERN, we are here. This point A is, is, is the globe, and, um, and Entoff is uh, somewhere over there. We go here in the zooming here. So we use here this proton beam of the... Of the, of the PS, and then we hit this piece of lead, making a lot of neutrons and looking about 200 meters further away um, uh, what is happening uh, on nuclear reactions. So this is the time of flight method. Probably you know this, but let's see. At the time zero, you have a pulsed beam of charged particles, the protons here, hitting the piece of lead. There is some moderation, and the neutrons of all energies start to fly. Uh, and then, of course, the faster neutrons go first. They arrive at a kind of sample. You measure your reactant products, and then you have the time of flight, which you can relate to the energy, and you get a reaction rate as a function of neutron energy. This is what you would like to measure. Of course, the reality is a little bit more complicated. There are collimators. There's a sweeping magnet to get away, uh, to get rid of charged particles, and then the facility was working, so we go back uh, through history a little bit. Um, phase one, later we called it phase one, when 
uh, we had phase two. And let's say about 2002 and up to 2004, that was a first period of data taking. This was also part of a European project, and lots of data have been taken. I go through a few examples. Uh, for example, here, Lanthanum 139, that was one of the first measurements, and you see uh, a background, and you see popping up all these resonances over a very wide range of energies. Thorium. Uh, yesterday, during the Sandal presentation, we had already this picture here. Uh, this is the unresolved resonance region. Here you see the result of the measurements in black points at Antof and the modelization uh, of this cross-section with a black curve. And here we see the same measurement, but now in the reson resolved resonance region. So you have here the measured data points, and in red, an R matrix fit of all these resonances. So this is was making a very accurate measurement of the thorium cross-section. We have other examples here, osmium. Um, we have several detectors as well, capture detectors here. This is a very nice detector, a 4 pi calorimeter uh, of barium fluoride uh, crystals, measuring the gamma rays after neutron capture. And we did quite some nice measurements here, plutonium 240. You see at that time, we still had to encapsulate the, the samples into very thick uh, cannings for safety reasons. And you see here the, the, the effect of such a canning, this is titanium canning. Um, another example, emeritium 243. And here you see that with very small masses for time of flight experiments, of course, you can even get this, uh, seeing these resonances coming up uh, for, for emeritium 243. Um, very important measurement is uh, uranium-233. This is a fissile element which complicates everything because if you want to measure capture in presence of fission, this is technically extremely difficult. So we did a first try uh, back in this first phase and um, trying to, and we, I will show you later, we did do some improvements on that as well. We did as well some fission measurements using PPACs, uh, PPAC detectors and uh, fission ionization chambers with samples mounted inside and to measure fission um, uh, cross-sections. And here you see an example, uranium-234. You see here the fission um, uh, barrier, so the cross-section increases, but even because you cover this very large energy range, you see here the sub-threshold fission and all the resonances coming up. So this is also a very nice example of uh, fission measurement. And of course, uranium-233, an example here in the resolved resonance range at low energy. Um, and this is, a uh, let's say, um, a summary of the measurements that was done, that were done in, uh, in this first phase of, of, of data taking. Then there was a kind of stop of measurements. The program was finished. There were some problems with lead spallation target, and then at some point, CERN decided to continue with an end of experiment, and um, we got a second phase of data taking, which is uh, just finished, in fact. And there were some advantages. So we had a new spallation target, which was uh, making things a little bit better, and we had a what we call a class A lab. That means that you can have very highly radioactive targets inside the, the experimental area to measure them. And, okay, this is the old target. You see here the pieces of, of, of lead that were, uh, the lead blocks were used for the target experiment before, and uh, they were used, uh, there was water around, proton hitting in. And then the new target, well, well, this is of course something completely new. You get here an idea of the size, somebody which is, you see here the lead inside a, 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 a nice vessel, and here they are closing the vessel and mounting it in the, in the pit where uh, the, the protons could hit it and then the neutrons were sent in the, in the neutron time of flight tube. So this was this first phase, uh, phase one target, so the pieces of lead, protons coming in, neutrons going out, uh, a little bit of water around to cool the target and to uh, moderate the neutrons, and then we have this phase two target, which is a nicely compact uh, um, uh, thing, uh, 
uh, with, with a separated cooling and moderator, so we could even change the moderation, use borated water to decrease the thermal flux and to improve the, the measurements or backgrounds from, from, from capturing in, in, in the hydrogen, of course. Uh, okay, here are some key data of this, uh, of this uh, uh, new facility, which were uh, upcoming there, and Okay, the main advantage of this very high flux that can be attained with this um, uh, 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 target is that you can uh, have a very favorable signal-to-noise ratio for uh, radioactive targets. So if you have a lot of newtons and a lot of radioactivity, uh, of course the ratio between newtons and radioactivity is going in favor if you have a lot of newtons. And that is the case with this very intense, brilliant, uh, Newton source uh, at CERN. Here is the effect of this moderator where you decrease the thermal flux and uh, where you can improve for some kind of measurements uh, uh, what has been measured. This is a little bit uh, a view of inside the, the, the experimental area where you have the tube of, uh, of Newtons and you see here the, the barium fluoride detector, the C6, D6 detectors, other capture detectors. And from the other side you see here in-beam Newton monitor detectors that have been developed for that. And of course we need to know how this neutron beam looks like, so we developed other detectors, very thin detectors, to, to make an image of the beam and to get really the profile of the neutron beam as a function of the neutron energy, because this is very important to have if you do a measurement on such a large energy region, you need to normalize, you need to be sure what is coming in. This is an example of this Phase two measurements, so nickel-63, which is a radioactive sample, and you see a very nice... Uh, uh, there is a little bit of nickel-62 inside, but you see here, again, all these resonances coming up here. Another example of gold and americium-241, which is, uh, was also a nightmare to get this sample, but thanks to this... Um, um, uh, class A lab, we could measure this sample. To get a sample is another thing. This is a problem that comes back all the time. We, we need clean samples, isotopically enriched, very pure, and, and this is extremely difficult to get, except uh, especially for this type of targets which are radioactive and not easily available. Um, this is a result of the measurement. Again, you see here all the resonances, the unresolved region, and you see this enormous energy range that can be covered with this uh, type of experiments. Other experiments concern fission, angular distribution of fission fragments, are, and this is uh, one of our new um, approaches of, of, of difficult samples. Uh, I told you before about the uranium-233 fissile measurement. You want to measure capture. It's very difficult. The same holds for uranium-235, which is a little bit better known. So we try to measure that first and measure fission and capture at the same time. So we can veto the fission and see whatever comes from the capture. And that would allow you to measure um, uh, fission and capture uh, at the same time. And this is a summary of all the measurements that were done in the second phase, which ended by the end of last year. And then, thanks to the uh, outstanding work of our spokesperson, Enrico Chiaveri, we are now facing uh, a new era of this end uh, uh, of facility by having a second flight path. And that is a little bit of a... Uh, it's, a it's a kind of novelty. Because what we have now here is we have a horizontal flight path, existing first um, experimental area 200 meters away. So here's the lead spallation target and the Newtons go in this direction. Now the idea is to construct a vertical flight path. So you are going up. The whole thing is underground, so you have to build something here at the floor level. And this second area, which has a flight path which is much shorter, 20 meters, so you will increase the flux. You will decrease a little bit the resolution, but for many measurements, if you have only a very tiny amount of sample material available, this will be a perfect solution for, for, for new types of, of measurements and, and, and isotopes that we can address in this way. So, these are pictures of this um, 
of course, you see here, uh, it's a drawing of this new vertical area. Uh, unfortunately, it is not on the, on, on the visit schedule because it's under construction at the moment, but maybe uh, you can pass by and, and if you see some works going on, it must be this uh, second area under construction. Um, let me go through these characteristics because we have a, it's, it's a 10 times shorter a distance, so the flux is much higher. Due to collimation effects, it's about a factor of 25 higher flux. But also, the full energy range uh, is mapped on a time scale which is a little time of flight scale which is a little bit shorter, uh, and that is really a factor 10. So, for radioactive samples, again, you gain a factor of 25 in flux and 10 in time, which is a factor of 250. So that makes it really possible to measure highly radioactive targets. And that is uh, one of the great strengths of this uh, uh, new um, flight path. And here you see the thing is really under construction. Here is the, 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 the building that will host the second area and with the neutron beam coming inside uh, from the floor up. So this is a worldwide unique uh, thing. There, to my knowledge, there is no other facility with a vertical flight path, so it creates new problems as well. So they, all these problems have to be solved. They are being solved. CERN has accepted this because you can see it here. It's already constructed, and we just get approved for um, to, to commission this uh, area as well. Next year, the thing will be operational, July 2014. Um, just the last word about the end of collaboration. So it is a collaboration of many people, like our, the DG, Ralph Heyer, already said yesterday, if you have a common goal, you can get things working. So here we have a common goal with uh, about 100 scientists, all, uh, divided over 33 institutions, uh, many of the in the European Union, but also from the USA, uh, India, Bark was uh, present uh, as well. Um, at, at present, we had 16 PhD students, which are there are new coming, new ones coming, all the ones going away. And from July 2014, we will have this new flight path. Uh, uh, we have two experiment areas; they can operate simultaneously. And I think this will be a large impulse for uh, new nuclear data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any questions for Frank? Yes. Okay, thank you for your uh, ex excellent uh, uh, talk. And um, my, I have a question. Um, uh, since the phase three is uh, 10 times shorter than the, uh, than the former, um, is there any decrease of the uh, resolution of the Energy? Yes, indeed. There is a slight decrease in resolution. Of course, this is the price you have to pay for a higher flux. Uh, but we will have the two areas simultaneously. So if we can always choose, do we want to uh, have more resolution or do we need really uh, the, the, the higher flux? So it's a choice to be made for every experiment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I congratulate you on the phase one, phase two, and now the phase three program. I have two questions. One is on the experimental uh, arrangement in phase two that is going to come, phase three that's going to come. The other one is on the uh, post-processing uh, of this data. The first question is, uh, do we have plans in CERN and TOF to have a cryo-cooling of the uh, target sample for which we are measuring data so that the Doppler broadening effects can be reduced and uh, sharp P-wave resonances and uh, extension of the resolved regions could be done uh, to, to a larger energies. This is the first question. The second question is, when you make a measurement, resonance measurement, and uh, I assume that these are all going into the X4 database in the way X4 people would like to have it for future renormalization and other analysis. And uh, when, you, when do we see this in the actual ENDB file for uh, users around the world? Because the, right now these data are generated and it's published in uh, leading journals. Hmm. And uh, where do we stand? 
Okay. Uh, your first question, uh, can we use uh, cryogenic uh, targets, so cool down the targets so you can really uh, go down much closer to the intrinsic width and not get bothered too much by the Doppler broadening. So this is a very complicated task, so first we want to get the thing running, but of course we cannot exclude in the future that we get such a thing, but it is uh, much more complicated and it creates also a lot of background because you need a kind of insulation, you increase the mass around the sample. So it's not easy, but um, um, it's, it's something to be considered. So now the data, um, if I go back to the beginning, uh, uh, we, we had this picture of uh, how data are uh, traveling. So here we have measurements. Of course, they, the measurements do not go directly to the evaluated data library. They first go to an experimental data library, as you mentioned, X4. And um, between the X4 and having an evaluated data library, this is another time-consuming step because the evaluator, which is somebody making the evaluated data, uh, needs to go through all these experiments, find the best things, make some judgments, and often there is um, a considerable time delay um, between these things. But that doesn't matter, or that doesn't uh, uh, take away that we uh, have some examples, for example, the thorium-232. Uh, our data is included in the evaluation for the latest NDEF uh, B7.1 evaluation. So sometimes we advance the data to the evaluators before they are getting published, so they can include that in the evaluations. This is an important step, I think. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, you measure the um, N-gamma and the and the fission, presumably with different detector arrangements. So why is it not possible to do it always simultaneously? Uh, well, it is a new technique that we are trying to develop, to have mm. a fission chamber or several fission chambers inside a capture detector, because you generate as well a lot of background. But if that is the way, so now we are trying this with uranium-235, can we get the existing data. If that is the case, we know we are on the right track and we continue with the uranium-233 and then possibly with any other isotope. But you have to know that for fission you need very thin samples, uh, just a few uh, hundreds of micrograms per square centimeter of maximum. For capture you would like to have a little bit more uh, thick samples. That is why we put several layers of, of, of fish, fissionable targets inside a number of 10 or something like that. Uh, the other thing is to, to get these samples because it is not so easy to get uh, a stack of 10 layers of fissional samples and to put that in the detector. So for every isotope, we have to carefully study how we can proceed. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, I think we thank... Uh